This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Riccardo. History of Holland by George Edmondson. Chapter 4 the revolt of the netherlands the complete failure of the expeditions of hoogstraeten and of lewis of nassau was a great discouragement to the prince of orange nevertheless after receiving the news of jemmingen he wrote to his brother with god's help i am determined to go on by great exertions he succeeded in gathering together a heterogeneous force of German and Walloon mercenaries numbering about 18,000 men, and with these in the beginning of October he crossed the frontier. But to maintain such a force in the field required far larger financial resources than William had at his disposal. Alva was aware of this, and as the prince made his way into Brabant, he followed his steps with a small body of veteran troops, cutting off supplies and stragglers, but declining battle. The mercenaries, debarred from plunder and in arrears of pay, could not be kept together more than a few weeks. In November, Orange withdrew into France and disbanded the remnants of his army. In disguise, he managed to escape with some difficulty through France to Dillenburg. His brothers, Lewis and Harry, joined the Huguenot army under Coligny and took part in the battles of Montcontour and Jarnac. Alva was not apparently supreme in the Netherlands, and crowds of refugees fled the country to escape the wholesale persecutions of the Council of Blood. Alva, however, like his predecessor, and indeed like all Spanish governors engaged in carrying out the policy of Philip II, was always hampered by lack of funds. The Spanish treasury was empty. The governor-general's troops, no less than those of Orange, clamoured for their regular pay, and it was necessary to find means to satisfy them. The taxes voted for nine years in 1559 had come to an end. New taxes could only be imposed with the assent of the states-general. Alva, however, after his victory at Jemingen and the dispersion of the army of Orange, felt himself strong enough to summon the states-general and demand their assent to the scheme of taxation which he proposed. The governor-general asked for, one, a tax of five per cent, the twentieth penny, on all transfers of real estate, two, a tax of ten per cent, the tenth penny, on all sales of commodities. These taxes, which were an attempt to introduce into the Netherlands the system known in Castile as Alcabala, were to be granted in perpetuity, thus, as the Duke hoped, obviating the necessity of having again to summon the States-General. In addition to these annual taxes, he proposed a payment once for all of one per cent, the hundredth penny, on all property, real or personal. Such a demand was contrary to all precedent in the Netherlands, and an infringement of time-honoured charters and privileges. And even the terror which Alva's iron-handed tyranny had inspired did not prevent his meeting with strong opposition. The proposals had to be referred to the provincial estates, and everywhere difficulties were raised. All classes were united in resistance. Petitions came pouring in protesting against impositions which threatened to ruin the trade and industries of the country. Alva found it impossible to proceed. The hundredth penny was voted, but instead of the other taxes, which were to provide a steady annual income, he had to content himself with a fixed payment of two million guilders for two years only. The imposition of these taxes on the model of their cabala had been part of a scheme for sweeping away all the provincial jurisdictions and rights and forming the whole of the Netherlands into a unified state as subservient to despotic rule as was Castile itself. 
a greater centralization of government had been the constant policy of the Burgundian and Habsburg rulers since the time of Philip the Good, a policy to be commanded if carried out in a statesmanlike and moderate spirit without any sudden or violent infringement of traditional liberties. The aim of Philip of Spain, as it was interpreted by his chosen instrument, the Duke of Alva, was far more drastic. With Alva and his master all restrictions upon the absolute authority of the sovereign were obstacles to be swept remorselessly out of the way. Civil and religious liberty in their eyes deserved no better fate than to be suppressed by force. Alva's experience was that of many would-be tyrants before and since his day, that the successful application of force is limited by the power of the purse. His exchequer was empty. Philip was himself in financial difficulties, and could spare him no money from Spain. The refusal of the provincial estates of the Netherlands to sanction his scheme of taxation deprived him of the means for imposing his will upon them. His reign of terror had produced throughout the land a superficial appearance of peace. There were at the beginning of 1570 no open disturbances or insurrectionary movements to be crushed, but the people were seething with discontent, and the feeling of hatred aroused by the presence of the Spanish Inquisition and the foreign soldiery, and by the proceedings of the Council of Blood, was day by day becoming deeper and more embittered. This condition of affairs was duly reported to the king at Madrid and there was no lack of counsellors at his side who were unfriendly to Alva and eager to make the most of the complaints against him. Among these enemies was Rui Gomez, the king's private secretary, who recommended a policy of leniency, as did Granvelle, who was now at Naples. Philip never had any scruples about throwing over his agents, and he announced his intention of proclaiming an amnesty on the occasion when Anne of Austria, his intended bride and fourth wife, set sail from Antwerp for Spain. The proclamation was actually made at Antwerp by the Governor-General in person, July sixteenth, 1570. It was a limited declaration of clemency, for six classes of offenders were accepted, and it only extended to those who, within two months, made their peace with the Catholic Church and abjured the Reformed doctrines. During the years 1570-71 there were, however, few outward signs of the gradual undermining of Alva's authority. There was sullen resentment and discontent throughout the land, but no attempt at overt resistance. The iron hand of the governor-general did not relax its firm grasp of the reins of power, and the fear of his implacable vengeance filled men's hearts. He ruled by force, not by love, and those who refused to submit had either to fly the country or to perish by the hands of the executioner. Nevertheless, during these sad years, the Prince of Orange and Lewis of Nassau, in spite of the apparent hopelessness of the situation, were unremitting in their efforts to raise fresh forces. William, at Dillenburg, exerted himself to the uttermost to obtain assistance from the Protestant princes of the Rhineland. With the Calvinists he was, however, as yet strongly suspect. He himself was held to be a lukewarm convert from Catholicism to the doctrines of Augsburg, and his wife, was the daughter and the heiress of Maurice of Saxony, the champion of Lutheranism. William's repudiation of Anne of Saxony for her repeated infidelities, March 1571, severed this Lutheran alliance. The unfortunate Anne, after six years' imprisonment, died insane in 1577. At the same time, the closest relations of confidence and friendship sprang up between Orange and the well-known Calvinist writer and leader, Philippe de Marny, lord of saint aldegonde This connection with saint aldegonde ensured for William the support of the Calvinists, and secret agents of the prince were soon busily at work in the different parts of the provinces, 
premising armed assistance and collecting levies for the rising of an invading force. Foremost among these active helpers were Jacob von Wesenbeke, Diederik Sonoy, and Paul Beuys, and the chief scene of their operations were the provinces of Holland and Zealand, already distinguished for their zeal in the cause of freedom. The amount of cash that was raised was, however, for some time very small. There was good will in plenty, but the utter failure of the prince's earlier efforts had made people despair. These earlier efforts had indeed on land been disastrous, but they had not been confined entirely to land operations. Orange, in his capacity as sovereign prince, had given letters of marque to a number of vessels under the command of the Lord of Delan. These vessels were simply corsairs, and they were manned by fierce, fanatical sectaries, desperados inflamed at once by bitter hatred of the papist and by the hope of plunder. These beggars of the sea, gueux de mer, as they were called, rapidly increased in number and soon made themselves a terror in the narrow seas by their deeds of reckless daring and cruelty. William tried in vain to restrain excesses which brought him little profit and no small discredit. It was to no purpose that he associated the Lord of Lambre in the chief command with Dolin. Their subordinates, William de Blois, Lord of Trelon, and William de la Marque, lord of Lumé, were bold, unscrupulous adventurers who found it to their interest to allow their unruly crews to burn and pillage as they lasted not only their enemies' ships in the open sea, but churches and monasteries along the coast and up the estuaries that they infested. The difficulty was to find harbours in which they could take refugee and dispose of their booty. For some time they were permitted to use the English ports freely, and the Huguenot stronghold at La Rochelle was also open to them as a market. Queen Elizabeth, as was her wound, had no scruple in conniving attacks of piracy to the injury of the Spaniard. But at last, at the beginning of 1572, in consequence of strong representations from Madrid, she judged it politic to issue an order forbidding the sea beggars to enter any English harbours. The pirates, thus deprived of the shelter which had made their depredations possible, would have been speedily in very bad case, but for an unexpected and surprising stroke of good fortune. It chanced that a large number of vessels under Lambre and Trelong were driven by stress of weather into the estuary of the Mars, and finding that the Spanish garrison of Brill had left the town upon a punitive expedition, the rowers landed and effected an entry by burning one of the gates. The place was seized and pillaged, and the marauders were on the point of returning with their spoil to their ships, when, at the suggestion of Trelon, it was determined to place a garrison in the town and hold it as a harbour of refuge in the name of the Prince of Orange as stadtholder of Holland. On April the 1st, 1572, the prince's flag was hoisted over Brill, and the foundation stone was laid of the future Dutch Republic. William himself at first did not realize the importance of this capture, and did not take any steps to express his active approval. But it was otherwise with his brother Lewis, who was at the time using his utmost endeavors to secure, if not the actual help, at least the connivance of Charles the Ninth to his conducting an expedition from France into the Netherlands. Lewis saw at once the great advantage to the cause of the possession of a port like Brill, and he urged the beggars to try and gain possession of Flushing also, before Alva's orders for the strengthening of the garrison and the defences had been carried out. Flushing, by its position, commanded the approach by water to Antwerp. When the ships of Lambre and Trelong appeared before the town, the inhabitants rose in revolt, overpowered the garrison and opened the gates. The striking success following upon the taking of Brill aroused great enthusiasm. The rebels had now a firm foothold both in Holland and Zealand, and their numbers grew rapidly from day to day. Soon the whole of the island of Volcheren 
on which Flushing stands, was in their hands, with the exception of the capital Middelburg, and in Holland several important towns hoisted the flag of revolt and acknowledged the Prince of Orange as their lawful stadtholder. From Holland the rebellion spread into Friesland. Finally, on June nineteenth, an assembly of the Estates of Holland was, at the instance of Dordrecht, convened to meet in that town. There was but one representative of the nobility present at this meeting, whose legality was more than doubtful, but it included deputies of no less than twelve out of the fourteen towns which were members of the estates. The prince sent saint Aldegonde as his plenipotentiary. The step taken was practically an act of insurrection against the king. William had resigned his stadtholdership in 1568, and had afterwards been declared an outlaw. Bossu had been by royal authority appointed to the vacant office. The estates now formally recognized the prince as stadtholder of the king in Holland, Zeeland, West Friesland and Utrecht, and he was further invested with the supreme command of the forces both by land and sea, and was charged with the duty of protecting the country against foreign oppression or invasion by foreign troops. Saint Aldegonde, in the name of the prince, announced his acceptance of the posts that had been conferred on him, and declared that he desired, as a condition of such acceptance, that the principle of religious freedom and liberty of worship should be conceded to Catholics and Protestants alike. To this the estates assented. Orange took an oath to maintain the towns in the rights and privilege of which they had been deprived by Alve, and not to enter into any negotiations or conclude any treaty with Spain without their consent. The Court of Holland for the administration of justice was reconstituted and a chamber of finance erected. The question of finance was indeed crucial, for the new stadtholder asked for a subsidy of 100,000 crowns a month for the support of the army he had raised for the invasion of Robin, and the estates agreed to make measures for appropriating certain taxes for the purpose, an undertaking which had, however, in this time of present distress, small likelihood of effectual result. The course of events, indeed, in the months which followed this historic gathering at Dordrecht, was not encouraging to those who had thus dared somewhat prematurely to brave the wrath of Philip and the vengeance of Alva. Lewis of Nassau had for some time been engaged in raising a Huguenot force for the invasion of the southern Netherlands. The news of the capture of Brill and Flushing stirred him to sudden action. He had collected only a small body of men, but, with characteristic impetuosity, he now led these across the frontier, and, before Alva was aware of his presence in Hainault, had captured by surprise Valenciennes and Mons, May the 24th. It was a rash move, for no sooner did the news reach the governor-general than he sent his son, Don Frederick of Toledo, at the head of a powerful force to expel the invader. Don Frederick quickly made himself master of Valenciennes, and then proceeded, June the 3rd, to lay siege to Mons, while Lewis, in hopes that relief would reach him, prepared for an obstinate defence. These hopes were not without foundation for he knew that, beyond the Rhine, Orange, with a considerable army, was on the point of entering the Netherlands from the east, and that the Huguenot leader, Jean Ly, was leading another force from France to his succour. William, at the head of 20,000 German and 3,000 Walloon mercenaries, actually entered Gelderland July the 7th, captured Roermont, and then marched into Brabant. Here, July the 19th, the news reached him of the complete defeat and annihilation of the raw levies of Jean Lee by Toledo's veteran troops. Hampered by lack of funds, William now, as throughout his life, showed himself to be lacking in their higher qualities of military leadership. With a nil-paid mercenary force, time was a factor of primary importance. Nevertheless, 
The prince made no effort to move from his encampment near Roermont for some five weeks. Meanwhile, his troops got out of hand and committed many excesses, and when on August the 27th he set out once more to march westwards, he found to his disappointment that there was no popular rising in his favour. Louvain and Brussels shut their gates, and though Michelin, Termont, and a few other places surrendered, the prince saw only too plainly that his advance into Flanders would not bring about the relief of Mons. All his plans had gone awry. Alva could not be induced to withdraw any portion of the army that was closely blockading Mons, but contented himself in following Orange with a force under his own command, while avoiding a general action. And then, like a thunderclap, September the 5th, the news of the massacre of St. Bartholomew was brought to the prince, and he knew that the promise of Coligny to conduct twelve thousand arquebusiers to the succour of Lewis could not be redeemed. In this emergency, William saw that he must himself endeavour to raise the siege. He accordingly marched from Flanders, and, September the 11th, encamped at the village of Harmigny, a short distance from Mons. In the night, six hundred Spaniards, each of whom, to prevent mistakes, wore a white shirt over his armour, surprised the camp. The prince himself was awakened by a little dog that slept in his tent, and only narrowly escaped with his life, several hundred of his troops being slain by the camisaders. He was not thoroughly discouraged, and on the following day retreated first to Mechelin, then to Roermont, where on September the 30th, the ill-fated expedition was disbanded. The retirement from Harmigny decided the fate of Mons. Favourable conditions were granted, and Lewis of Nassau, who was ill with fever, met with chivalrous treatment, and was allowed to return to Dillenburg. William now found himself faced with something like financial ruin. Mercenaries' armies are very costly, and by bitter experience he had learned the futility of opposing a half-hearted and badly disciplined force to the veteran troops of Alva. He resolved, therefore, to go in person to Holland to organize and direct the strong movement or revolt, which had found expression in the meeting of Estates at Dordrecht. His agents had long been busy going about from town to town, collecting funds in the name of the prince, and encouraging the people in their resistance to the Inquisition and to foreign tyranny. William's declaration that henceforth he intended to live and die in their midst, and to devote himself with all his powers to the defence of the rights and liberties of the land, met with willing and vigorous support throughout the greater part of Holland, West Friesland and Zealand and contributions for the supply of the necessary ways and means began to flow in. It was, however, a desperate struggle to which he had pledged himself, and to which he was to consecrate without flinching the rest of his life. If, however, the prince's resolve was firm, no less so was that of Alva. Alva had his enemies at the Spanish court, always ready to excite distrust against the duke in the mind of the suspicious king. In July 1572, the Duke of Medina Medinaceli had been sent from Spain to inquire into the state of affairs in the Netherlands. Probably it was intended that he should take over the administration and supersede the governor-general. On his arrival, however, Medina Medinaceli quickly saw that the difficulties of the situation required a stronger hand than his, and he did not attempt to interfere with Alva's continued exercise of supreme authority. The governor-general on his side knew well what was the meaning of this mission of Medina Ceri, and no sooner was the army of Orange dispersed than he determined, while the reins of power were still in his hand, to visit the rebellious towns of the north with condign vengeance. At the head of a powerful force, Frederick of Toledo marched northwards. 
Michelin, which had received Orange, was given over for three days to pillage and outrage. Then Sutphen was taken and sacked. Narden, which had, though without regular defences, dared to resist the Spaniards, was utterly destroyed and the entire population massacred. Amsterdam, one of the few towns of Holland which had remained loyal to the king, served as a basis for further operations. Although it was already December and the season was unfavourable, Toledo now determined to lay siege to the important town of Haarlem. Haarlem was difficult of approach. It was protected on two sides by broad sheets of shallow water. The Haarlem Lake and the estuary of the Wye, divided from one another by a narrow neck of land. On another side was a thick wood. It was garrisoned by four thousand men, stern Calvinists, under the resolute leadership of Ripperda and Lancelot Bredrode. An attempt to storm the place, December 21st, was beaten off with heavy loss to the assailants. So Toledo, despite the inclemency of the weather, had to invest the city. Another desperate assault, January the 31st, disastrously failed, and the siege was turned into a blockade. The position, however, of the besiegers was in some respect worse than that of the besieged, and Toledo would have abandoned his task in despair, had not his father ordered him at all costs to proceed. William, meanwhile, made several efforts to relieve the town. Bodies of skaters in the winter, and when the ice disappeared, numbers of boats crossed over the Harlem Lake from Leyden and managed to carry supplies of food into the town, and resistance might have been indefinitely prolonged had not Bossu put a stop to all intercourse between Harlem and the outside world by convoying a flotilla of armed vessels from the Wye into the lake. Surrender was now only a question of time. On July the 11th, 1573, after a relieving force of 4,000 men sent by Orange had been utterly defeated and the inhabitants were perishing by famine, Toledo gained possession of Harlem. The survivors of the heroic garrison were all butchered, and Ripperda and Brederode, their gallant leaders, executed. A number of the leading citizens were likewise put to death, but the town was spared from pillage on condition of paying a heavy fine. The siege had lasted seven months, and the army of Toledo, which had suffered terribly during the winter, is said to have lost twelve thousand men. Alva, in his letters to the king, laid great stress on the clemency with which he had treated Harlem. It had been spared the wholesale destruction of Sutphen and Narden, and the duke hoped that by this exhibition of comparative leniency he might induce the other rebel towns to open their gates without opposition. He was deceived. On July the 18th, Awikma was summoned to surrender but refused. Alva's indignation knew no bounds, and he vowed that every man, woman and child in the contumacious town should be put to the sword. The threat, however, could not at once be executed. Toledo's army, debarred from the sack of Harlem, became mutinous through lack of pay. Until they received the arrears due to them, they refused to stir. Not till August the 21st was Don Frederick able to invest Awekama with a force of 16,000 men. The garrison consisted of some 1,300 burghers with 800 troops thrown into the town by Sonoy, Orange's lieutenant in North Holland. Two desperate assaults were repulsed with heavy loss, and then the Spaniards proceeded by blockade the town. Sonoy now, by the orders of the prince, gained the consent of the cultivators of the surrounding district through the cutting of the dikes. The camps and trenches of the besiegers were flooded out. 
and, October the 8th, the siege was raised and the army of Don Frederick retired, leaving Awikmar untaken. Within a week another disaster befell the Spanish arms. Between Horen and Enkhuizen, the fleet of Bossu on the Zoida Zee was attacked by the sea beggars and was completely defeated. Bossu himself was taken prisoner and was held as a hostage for the safety of Santa de Gond, who fell into the hands of the Spaniards about a month later. This naval victory, following upon the retreat from Awekma, strengthened greatly the efforts of Orange and gave fresh life to the patriot cause. It likewise marked the end of the six years of Alva's blood-stained rule in the Netherlands. Weary and disappointed, always hampered by lack of funds, angry at the loss of the king's confidence and chafing at the evidence of it in the presence of Medina Cheri at his side, the governor-general begged that he might be relieved of his functions. His request was granted October the 29th. The chosen successor was the Grand Commander Don Luis de Requesens, governor of Milan. It was only with much reluctance that Requesens, finding the king's command insistent and peremptory, accepted the charge. The Grand Commander was indeed far from being a suitable man for dealing with the difficult situation in the Netherlands, for he was a Spanish grandee, pure and simple, and did not even speak French. Even the loyalists received him coolly. He knew nothing of the country, and whatever his ability or disposition, it was felt that he would not be allowed a free hand in his policy or adequate means for carrying it out. That his temper was conciliatory was quickly shown. An amnesty was proclaimed for political offenders except three hundred persons, among these Orange and his principal adherents and pardoned all heretic who abjured their errors. He went even further than this by entering into a secret exchange of views with William himself through saint Aldegonde as an intermediary in the hope of finding some common meeting ground for an understanding. But the prince was immovable. Unless freedom of worship, the upholding of all ancient charters and liberties, and the removal of Spaniards and all foreigners from any share in the government or administration of the land were granted, resistance would be continued to the last. These were conditions Requesens had no power even to consider. Orange, during this time, was on his side using all his diplomatic ability to gain help for the oppressed Netherlanders from France and England. But Charles the Ninth had his own difficulties and was in too feeble health, he died May 1574, to take any decided step, and Queen Elizabeth, though she connived at assistance being given to the rebel cause on strictly commercial terms, was not willing either to show open hostility to Philip or to support subjects in revolt against their sovereign. William's position appeared well nigh desperate, for, at the opening of the year 1574, his authority was only recognized in a few of the towns of Holland and in some of the Zealand islands, and the Spaniards had sent a large force to invest Leyden. He had, however, made up his mind to cast in his lot with the brave Hollanders and Zealanders in their gallant struggle against overwhelming odds. To identify himself more completely with his followers, the prince, October 1573, openly announced his adhesion to Calvinism. There are no grounds for doubting his sincerity in taking this step. It was not an act of pure opportunism. His early Catholicism had probably been little more than an outward profession, and as soon as he began to think seriously about religious questions, his natural bent had led him first to the Lutheran faith of his family, and then to the sterner doctrines which had gained so firm a foothold in the towns of Holland and Zealand. Nevertheless, William, though henceforth a consistent Calvinist, 
was remarkable among his contemporaries for the principles of religious toleration he both inculcated and practised. He was constitutionally averse to religious persecution in any form, and by the zealots of his party he was denounced as lukewarm. But throughout his life he upheld the right of the individual, who was peaceful and law-abiding, to liberty of opinion and freedom of worship. The year 1574 opened favourably. By a remarkable feat of arms, the veteran Spanish commander Mondragon had, October 1572, reconquered several of the Zealand islands. His men on one occasion at ebb tide marched across the channel which lies between South Befelond and the mainland, the water reaching up to their necks. The patriot forces had since then recovered much of the lost ground, but Middelburg was strongly held, and so long as the Spaniards had command of the sea was the key to the possession of Zealand. On January the twenty ninth, fifteen seventy four, the sea beggars under Boiseau attacked the Spanish fleet near Rummersval, and after a bloody encounter gained a complete victory. The siege of Middelburg was now pressed, and Mondragon surrendered, February the 18th. The prince at once set to work to create a patriot government in the province. Four towns had representatives, Middelburg, Zirikzee, Vere and Flushing. William himself acquired by purchase the Marquisate of Flushing, and thus was able to exercise a preponderating influence in the provincial estates, all of whose members were required to be Calvinists and supporters of the rebel cause. The investment of Leyden by the Spaniards threatened, however, now that Harlem had fallen, to isolate South Holland and Zealand and William did not feel himself strong enough to make any serious attempt to raise the siege. Louis of Nassau, therefore, with the help of French money, set himself to work with his usual enthusiastic energy to collect a force in the Rhineland with which to invade the Netherlands from the east and effect a diversion. At the head of seven thousand foot and three thousand horse, half-disciplined troops, partly Huguenot volunteers, partly German mercenaries, he tried to cross the Meuse above Maastricht, with the intention of effecting a junction with the Prince of Orange. He was accompanied by John and Harry of Nassau, his brothers, and Christopher, son of the Elector Palatine. He found his course blocked by a Spanish force under the command of Sancho d'Avila and Mondragon. The encounter took place on the heath of Mauk, April the 14th, and ended in the crushing defeat of the invaders. Lewis and his young brother Harry and Duke Christopher perished, and their army was completely scattered. The death of his brothers was a great grief to William. Lewis had for years been his chief support, and the loss of this dauntless champion was indeed a heavy blow to the cause for which he had sacrificed his life. He was only thirty-six years of age, while Henry, the youngest of the Nassaus, to whom the prince was deeply attached, was but a youth of twenty-four. The invasion of Lewis had nevertheless the result of raising the siege of Leyden, but only for a time. After the victory at Mook, the Spanish troops were free to continue the task of reconquering rebel Holland for the king. On May the 26th, a strong force under Valdés advanced to Leyden and completely isolated the town by surrounding it with a girdle of forts. The attack came suddenly, and unfortunately the place had not been adequately provisioned. So strong was the position of the Spaniards that the stadtholder did not feel that any relieving force that he could send would have any chance of breaking through the investing lines and revitaling the garrison. In these circumstances he summoned June the first a meeting of the Estates of Holland at Rotterdam, and proposed, as desperate resource, that the dikes should be cut and the land submerged and that the light vessels of the sea beggars and the Boiseau should sail over the waters, attack the Spanish forts, and force an entrance into the town. 
after a considerable opposition the proposal was agreed to and the waters were allowed to flow up upon the low-lying fields villages and farms which lie between the sea the rhine the Waal, and the mass unfortunately the season was not favourable and though the water reached nearly to the higher land around leyden on which the spanish redoubts were erected and by alarming valdez caused him to press the blockade more closely it was not deep enough even for the light draught vessels which boiseau had gathered together to make their way to the town so the month of august passed and september began meanwhile the prince who was the soul of the enterprise was confined to his sick bed by a violent attack of fever and the pangs of famine began to be cruelly felt within the beleaguered town a portion of the citizens were half-hearted in the struggle and began to agitate for surrender and even sent out emissaries to try to make terms with the spanish commander but there were within laden leaders of iron resolution the heroic burgomaster peter adrianson von der Werf, the commandant of the garrison jon von der dus derek von bronckhorst jan von hort and many others who remained staunch and true in face of the appalling agony of a starving population men who knew the fate in store for them if they fell into the enemy's hands and were determined to resist as long as they had strength to fight at last in mid-september faint hopes began to dawn william recovered and a fierce equinoctial gale driving the flood tide up to the rivers gradually deepened the waters up to the very dike on which the entrenchments of the besiegers stood urged on by orange boiseau now made a great effort anxiously from the towers was the approach of the relieving fleet watched the town was at the very last extremity the people were dying of hunger on every side some fierce combats took place as soon as the sea beggars experts at this amphibious warfare arrived at the outlying spanish forts but not for long alarmed at the rising of the waters and fearing that the fleet of boiseau might cut off their escape the spaniards retreated in the night and on the morning of october the third vessels of the relieving force laden with provisions entered the town the long drawn out agony was over and laden saved from the fate of harlem just at the moment when further resistance had become impossible had laden fallen the probability is that the whole of south holland would have been conquered and the revolt might have collapsed in such a narrow escape well might the people of the town see an intervention of providence on their behalf the prince himself hastened to laden on the following day reorganized the government of the town and in commemoration of this great deliverance founded the university which was to become in the seventeenth century one of the most famous seats of learning in europe the successful relief of leyden was followed by a mutiny of the army of valdez they were owed long arrears of pay had endured great hardship and now that they saw themselves deprived of the hope of the pillage of the town they put their commander and his officers under arrest and marched under a leader elected by themselves into utrecht other mutinies occurred in various parts of the southern provinces for recusants had no funds and it was unless to appeal to philip for the spanish treasury was empty this state of things led to a practical cessation of active hostilities for many months and recusants seized the opportunity to open negotiations with orange these were however doomed to be fruitless for the king would not hear of any real consensus being made to the protestants the position of william was equally beset with difficulties politically and financially in the month following the relief of leyden he even threatened to withdraw from the country unless his authority were more fully recognized and adequate supplies were furnished for the conduct of the war the estates accordingly november the twelfth asked him to assume the title of regent or governor with absolute might authority and sovereign control of the affairs of the country 
they also voted him an allowance of forty nine thousand guilders a month but while thus conferring on the man who still claimed to be stadtholder of the king practically supreme power the burgher corporation of the towns were very jealous of surrendering in the smallest degree the control over taxation which was one of their most valued rights the exercise of authority however by the prince from this time forward was very great for he had complete control in military and naval matters and in the general conduct of affairs he held all the administrative threads in his own hands he had become indispensable and in everything but name a sovereign in holland and zealand the first part of fifteen seventy five was marked by a lull in warlike operation and conferences were held at breda between envoys of orange and recusants only to find that there was no common ground of agreement the marriage of the prince june the twenty fourth with charlotte de bourbon daughter of the duke of montpensier was a daring step which aroused much prejudice against him the bride who was of the blood royal of france had been abbess of jouard but had abjured her vows run away and become a calvinist this was bad enough but the legality of the union was rendered the more questionable by the fact that anne of saxony was still alive on all sides came protests from charlotte's father from john of nassau and from anne's relations in saxony and hesse but william's character was such that opposition only made him more determined to carry out his purpose the wedding was celebrated at brill with calvinist rites the union whether legitimate or not was undoubtedly one of great happiness meanwhile the governor-general unable to obtain any financial help from spain had managed to persuade the provinces always in dread of the excess of the mutinous soldiery to raise a loan of one million two hundred thousand guilders to meet their demands for arrears of pay Requesens was thus enabled to put in the late summer a considerable army into the field and among other successes to gain possession of the zealand islands doifelund and schoven on september twenty seventh a force under the command of the veteran mondragon waded across the shallow channels dividing the islands which fell into their hands Sirixzee, the chief town of schoven made a stout resistance but had at length to surrender july fifteen seventy six this conquest separated south holland from the rest of zealand and as harlem and amsterdam were in the hands of the spaniards the only territory over which the authority of orange extended was the low-lying corner of land between the rhine and the mass of which delft was the centre the situation again appeared well-nigh desperate and the stadtholder began to look anxiously round in the hope of obtaining foreign assistance it was to the interest of both france and england to assist a movement which distracted the attention and weakened the power of spain but henry the third of france was too much occupied with civil and religious disturbances in his own country and elizabeth of england while receiving with courtesy the envoys both of orange and recusants gave evasive replies to both she was jealous of france and pleased to see the growing embarrassment of her enemy philip but the tudor queen had no love either for rebels or for calvinists while refusing therefore openly to take the side of the hollanders and zealanders she agreed to give them secret help and no obstacle was placed in the way of the english volunteers who had already since fifteen seventy two been enlisting in the dutch service it was at this time that those english and scottish brigades were first formed which remained for nearly two centuries in that service and were always to be found in the very forefront of the fighting throughout the great war of liberation on march the fourth fifteen seventy six recusants died and in the considerable interval that elapsed before the arrival of his successor 
the outlook for the patriot cause became distinctly brighter. The estates of Holland and Zealand met at Delft, April the 25th, 1576, and the assembly was noteworthy for the passing of an act of federation. This act, which was the work of Orange, bound the two provinces together for common action in defence of their rights and liberties, and was the first step towards that larger union which three years later laid the foundation of the Dutch Republic. By this act sovereign powers were conferred upon William. He was in the name of the king to exercise all the prerogatives of a ruler. It required all this influence to secure the insertion of articles one extending a certain measure of toleration to all forms of religious worship that were not contrary to the gospel, two, giving authority to the prince in case of need to offer the protectorate of the federated provinces to a foreign prince. Orange knew only too well that Holland and Zealand were not strong enough alone to resist the power of Spain. His hopes of securing the support of other provinces, in which Catholics were in the majority, depended, he clearly saw, on the numerous adherents to the ancient faith in Holland and Zealand being protected against the persecuting zeal of the dominant Calvinism of those provinces. In any case, and this continued to be settled conviction to the end of his life, the actual independence of the whole or any portion of the Netherlands did not seem to him to lie within the bounds of practical politics. The object for which he strove was the obtaining of substantial guarantee for the maintenance of the ancient charters, which exempted the provinces from the presence of foreign officials, foreign tribunals, foreign soldiery and arbitrary methods of taxation. As Philip had deliberately infringed all those privileges which he had sworn to maintain, it was the duty of all patriotic Netherlanders to resist his authority, and, if resistance failed to bring a redress, to offer the sovereignty with the necessary restrictions to some other prince willing to accept it on those conditions and powerful enough to protect the provinces from Spanish attack. In order to grasp the principle which guided William's policy during the next few years, it is essential to bear in mind 1. that he sought to bring about a union of all the Netherland provinces on a basis of toleration. 2. that he did not aim at the erection of the Netherlands into an independent state. On the death of Requesens, the Council of State had assumed temporary charge of the administration. There had for some time been growing dissatisfaction even amongst the loyalist Catholics of the southern provinces at the presence and overbearing attitude of so many Spanish officials and Spanish troops in the land and at the severity of the religious persecution. Representation were made to the king by the Council of State of the general discontent throughout the country, of the deplorable results of the policy of force and repression, and urging the withdrawal of the troops the mitigation of the edicts, and the appointment of a member of the royal house to the governorship. To these representations and requests no answer was sent for months in accordance with Philip's habitual dilatoriness in dealing with the difficult affairs of state. He did, however, actually nominate in April his bastard brother, Don John of Austria, the famous victor of Lepanto, as Requesens' successor. But Don John, who was then in Italy, had other ambitions, and looked with suspicion upon Philip's motives in assigning him the thankless task of dealing with the troubles in the low countries. Instead of hurrying northwards, he first betook himself to Madrid, where he met with a cold reception. Delay, however, so far from troubling Philip, was thoroughly in accordance with the whole bent of his character and policy. For six months, Don John remained in Spain, and it was a half-year during which the situation in the Netherlands had been to a very large extent transformed. The position of Orange and his followers in Holland and Zealand in the spring of 1576 had again darkened. In June the surrender of Sirixie to Mondragon was a heavy blow to the Patriot cause, 
for it gave the spaniards a firm footing in the very heart of the zealand archipelago and drove a wedge between south holland and the island of volcheren this conquest was however destined to have important results of a very different character from what might have been expected the town had surrendered on favourable terms and pillage was forbidden bulked of their expected booty the spanish troops to whom large arrears of pay were due mutinied under their own elector they marched to arst where they were joined by other mutineers and soon a large force was collected together who lived by plunder and were a terror to the country the council declared them to be outlaws but the revolted soldiery defied its authority and scoffed at its threats this was a moment which as orange was quick to perceive was extremely favourable for a vigorous renewal of his efforts to draw together all the provinces to take common action in their resistance to spanish tyranny his agents and envoys in all parts of the netherlands but especially in flanders and brabant urged his views upon the more influential members of the provincial estates and upon leading noblemen like the duke of arschot and other hitherto loyal supporters of the government who were now suspected of weavering his efforts met with a success which a few months earlier would have been deemed impossible the conduct of spanish troops and the lack of any central authority to protect the inhabitants against their insolence and depredations had effected a great change in public opinion in brussels baron de hezé a godchild of the prince had been appointed to the command of the troops in the pay of the states of Rabban. De Hezé exerted himself to arouse popular opinion in the capital in favour of Orange and against the Spaniards. To such an extent was he successful that he ventured, September 21st, to arrest the whole of the Council of the State, with the exception of the Spanish member Roda, who fled to Antwerp. William now entered into direct negotiations with Arschot and other prominent nobles of Flanders and Brabant. He took a further step by sending, at the request of the citizens of Ghent, a strong armed force to protect the town against the Spanish garrison in the citadel. In the absence of any lawful government, the States-General were summoned to meet at Brussels on September 22nd. Deputies from Brabant, Flanders and Hainault alone attended, but in the same name of the States General they nominated Eilschot, Figlius and Sarsbord as Councillor of State, and appointed Eilschot to the command of the forces, with the Count of Lalang as his lieutenant. They then, September twenty seventh, approached the Prince with proposals for forming a union of all the provinces. As a preliminary, it was agreed that the conditions which had been put forward by William as indispensable, namely exclusion of all foreigners from administrative posts, dismissal of foreign troops, and religious toleration, should be accepted. The proposals were gladly received by William, and Ghent was chosen as the place where nine delegates from Holland and Zealand should confer within nine delegates nominated by the States-General as representing the other provinces. They met on October the 19th. Difficulties arose on two points, the recognition to be accorded to Don John of Austria and the principle of non-interference with religious beliefs. Orange himself had always been an advocate of toleration, but the representatives of Holland and Zealand showed an obstinate disinclination to allow liberty of Catholic worship within their borders. And this attitude of their might, in spite of the prince's efforts, have led to a breaking off of the negotiations, had not an event occurred which speedily led to a sinking of differences on the only possible basis that of mutual concession and compromise. The citadel of Antwerp was, during this month of October, garrisoned by a body of mutinous Spanish troops under the command of Sancho Davila, the victor of a Mork. Champagny, the governor, had with him a body of German mercenaries under a certain Count Oberstein, and at his request, such was the threatening attitude of the Spaniards, the States-General sent Hevray with a reinforcement of Walloon troops. 
On Sunday, November the 4th, the garrison, which had been joined by other bands of mutineers, turned the guns of the citadel upon the town and, selling forth, attacked the forces of Champagny. The Germans offered but a feeble resistance. Oberstein perished, Champagny and Havre took refuge on vessels in the river, and the Spaniards were masters of Antwerp. The scene of massacre, lust, and wholesale pillage which followed, left a memory behind it, unique in its horror, even among the excesses of this blood-stained time. The Spanish fury, as it was called, spelt the ruin of what, but a short time before, had been the wealthiest and most flourishing commercial city in the world. The news of this disaster reached the States General as they were in the act of considering the draft proposals which had been submitted to them by the Ghent Conference. At the same time, tidings came that Don John, who had travelled through France in disguise, had arrived at Luxembourg. They quickly therefore came to a decision to ratify the pact, known as the Pacification of Ghent, and on November the 8th it was signed. The Pacification was really a treaty between the Prince of Orange and the Estates of Holland and Zeeland on the one hand, and the States General representing the other provinces. It was agreed that the Spanish troops should be compelled to leave the Netherlands and that the States General on the whole seventeen provinces, as they were convened at the abdication of Charles V, should be called together to decide upon the question of religious toleration and other matters of national importance. Meanwhile, the placards against heresy were suspended and all the illegal measures and sentences of Alva declared null and void. His confiscated property was restored to Orange, and his position as stadtholder in Holland and Zealand acknowledged. Don John was informed that he would not be recognized as governor-general unless he would consent to dismiss the Spanish troops, accept the pacification of Ghent, and swear to maintain the rights and privileges of the provinces. Negotiations ensued, but for a long time to little purpose, and Don John, who was rather an impetuous knight-errant than a statesman and diplomatist, remained during the winter months at Namur, angry at his reception and chafing at the conditions imposed upon him, which he dared not accept without permission from the king. In December the States General contained deputies from all the provinces met at Brussels, and in January the pacification of Ghent was confirmed, and a new compact, to which the name of the Union of Brussels was given, was drawn up by a number of influential Catholics. This document, to which signatures were invited, was intended to give to the pacification of Ghent the sanction of popular support and to be at the same time a guarantee for the maintenance of the royal authority and the catholic religion the union of brussels was generally approved throughout the southern provinces and the signatories from every class were numbered by thousands don john who was at hui saw that it was necessary to temporize he was willing he declared to dismiss the foreign troops and send them out of the country and to maintain the ancient charters and liberties of the provinces provided that nothing was done to subvert the king's authority or the catholic faith finally on february the twelfth a treaty called the perpetual edict a most inappropriate name was signed and the states general acknowledged don john as governor-general the agreement was principally the work of Arschot and the loyalist Catholic party, who followed his leadership and was far from being entirely acceptable to Orange. He had no trust in the good faith of either Philip or his representative, and though he recommended Holland and Zealand to acquiesce in the treaty and acknowledged Don John as governor-general, it was with the secret resolve to keep a close watch upon his every action and not to brook any attempt to interfere with religious liberty in the two provinces in which he exercised almost sovereign power and with whose struggles for freedom he had identified himself the undertaking of don john with regard to the spanish troops was punctually kept 
Before the end of April they had left the country, and on May the 1st the new governor-general made his state entry into Brussels. It was to outward appearances very brilliant, but the hero of Lepanto found himself at once distrusted by the Catholic nobles and checkmated by the influence and diplomacy of the ever-watchful William of Orange. Chafing at his impotence, and ill-supported by the king, who sent no reply to his appeals for financial help, Don John suddenly left the capital and, placing himself at the head of a body of Walloon troops, seized Namur. Feeling himself in this stronghold more secure, he tried to bring pressure on the States-General to place in his hands wider powers and to stand by him in his efforts to force Orange to submit to the authority of the king. His efforts were in vain. William had warned the States-General and the nobles of the anti-Spanish party in Brabant and Flanders that Don John was not to be trusted, and he now pointed to the present attitude of the Governor-General as a proof that his suspicions were well founded. Indeed, the eyes of all true patriots began to turn to the Prince, who had been quietly strengthening his position, not only in Holland and Zealand, where he was supreme, but also in Utrecht and Gelderland, and popular movements in Brussels and elsewhere took place in his favour. So strongly marked was the orange feeling in the capital that the States-General acceded to the general wish that the prince should be invited to come in person to Brussels. Confidence was expressed by Catholics no less than by Protestants that only under his leadership could the country be delivered from Spanish tyranny. A deputation was sent, bearing the invitation, but for a while William hesitated in giving an affirmative reply. On September the 23rd, however, he made his entry into Brussels amidst general demonstration of joy, and was welcomed as the restorer and defender of the fatherland's liberty. Thus, ten years after he had been declared an outlaw and banished, did the Prince of Orange return in triumph to the town which had witnessed the execution of Egmont and Horn. It was the proudest day of his life, and the supreme point of his career. End of chapter 4《All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gesine. History of Holland by George Edmondson. Chapter 5. William the Silent. The position of William at Brussels after his triumphant entry, September 23, 1577, was by no means an easy one. His main support was derived from a self-elected council of eighteen, containing representatives of the guilds and of the citizens. This council controlled an armed municipal force, and was really master in the city. In these circumstances, the States-General did not venture upon any opposition to the popular wishes, in other words to William, whose influence with the masses was unbounded. The States-General, therefore, under pressure from the Eighteen, informed Don John, October 8th, that they no longer recognized him as Governor-General, and the Estates of Brabant, appointed to the Prince to the office of Ruwad, or Governor of the Province. Meanwhile a fresh factor of disturbance had been introduced into the troubled scene. Certain of the Catholic nobles, opposed to Spanish rule, but suspicious of Orange, had invited the twenty-year-old Archduke Matthias, brother of the Emperor, to accept the sovereignty of the Netherlands. Matthias, who was of an adventurous spirit, after some parleying, agreed. He accordingly left Vienna secretly, and at the end of October arrived in the Netherlands. Not content with this counterstroke, Ershot went to Ghent, to stir up opposition of the appointment of William as Ruard of Brabant. The populace, however, in Ghent was Orangist, 
and rising in revolt, seized Ershot and a number of other Catholic leaders, and threw them into prison. They were speedily released, but the breach between the Catholic nobles and the Calvinist stadtholder of Holland was widened. William himself saw in the coming of Matthias a favourable opportunity for securing the erection of the Netherlands into a constitutional state under the nominal rule of a Habsburg prince. By his influence, therefore, the States-General entered into negotiations with the Archduke, and Matthias finally was recognised, December 8th, as governor on condition that he accepted the Union of Brussels. He was also induced to place the real power in the hands of Orange, with the title of lieutenant-general. Matthias made his state entry into Brussels, January 18th, 1578. His position appeared to be strengthened by a treaty concluded with the English Queen, January 7th, by which Elizabeth promised to send over a body of troops and to grant a subsidy to the states, for the repayment of which the towns of Middelburg, Bruges and Gravelines were to be pledges. The news, however, of the step taken by Matthias had had more effect upon Philip II than the despairing appeals of his half-brother. A powerful army of tried Spanish and Italian troops, under the command of Alexander Farnese, Prince of Parma, son of the former regent Margaret, was sent to Flanders. Farnese was Don John's nephew, and they had been brought up together at Madrid, being almost of the same age. Already Philip had determined to replace Don John, whose brilliance as a leader in the field did not compensate for his lack of statesmanlike qualities. In Farnese, who by good fortune or deliberate choice, he had at length found a consummate general who was to prove himself a match even for William the Silent in all the arts of political combination and intrigue. At Jean Blou, January 31st, Don John and Palmer fell upon the levies of the States and gained a complete and almost bloodless victory. Had Philip supplied his governor-general with the money he asked for, Don John might have conquered the whole of the southern Netherlands, but without funds he could achieve little. Meanwhile all was confusion. The States-General withdrew from Brussels to Antwerp, and William, finding that Matthias was useless, began negotiations with France, England and Germany in the hope of finding in this emergency some other foreign prince ready to brave the wrath of Philip by accepting the suzerainty of the Netherlands. The Duke of Anjou, brother of the French king, was the favoured candidate in the Catholic party, and William, whose one aim was to secure the aid of a powerful protector in the struggle against Spain, was ready to accept him. Anjou, at the head of an army of 15,000 men, crossed the frontier at Mons, July 12th, and on the following August 13th, a treaty was agreed upon between him and the States-General, by which the French Duke, with the title of Defender of the Liberties of the Netherlands, undertook to help the States to expel the Spaniards from the Low Countries. But to add to the complications of the situation, a German force under the command of John Casimir, brother of the elector Palatine, and in the pay of Queen Elizabeth, invaded the hapless provinces from the east. The advent of John Casimir was greeted with enthusiasm by the Calvinist party, and it required all the skill and sagacity of the Prince of Orange to keep the peace and prevent the rival interests from breaking out into open strife in the face of the common enemy. But Don John was helpless, his repeated appeals for financial help remained unanswered, and sick at heart and weary of life, he contracted a fever and died in his camp at Namur, October the 1st, 1578. His successor in the governor-generalship was Alexander of Palmer, who had now before him a splendid field for the exercise of his great abilities. The remainder of the year 1578 saw a violent recrudescence of religious bitterness. In vain did Orange, who throughout his later life was a genuine and earnest advocate of religious toleration, strive to the utmost of his powers and with untiring patience to allay the suspicions and fears of the zealots. 
John Casimir at Ghent, in the fervour of his fanatical Calvinism, committed acts of violence and oppression, which had the very worst effect in the Walloon provinces. In this part of the Netherlands Catholicism was dominant, and there had always been in the provinces of Hainaut, Artois, and in the southern districts generally, a feeling of distrust towards Orange. The upholding of the principle of religious toleration by a man who had twice changed his faith was itself suspect, and Farnese left no means untried for increasing this growing anti-Orange feeling among the Catholic nobles. A party was formed which bore the name of the Malcontents, whose leaders were Montigny, Lalin, and Lamotte. With these the Governor-General entered into negotiations, with the result that an alliance was made between Hainaut, Artois, Lille, Douai, and Orchy, January 6, 1579, called the Union of Arras, for the maintenance of the Catholic faith, by which these Walloon provinces and towns expressed their readiness to submit to the king on condition that he were willing to agree to uphold their rights and privileges in accordance with the provisions of the pacification of Ghent. The Union of Arras did not as yet mean a complete reconciliation with the Spanish sovereign, but it did mean the beginning of a breach between the Calvinist North and the Catholic South, which the statecraft of Parma gradually widened into an impossible chasm. Before this took place, Anjou, Matthias, and John Casimir had alike withdrawn from the scene of anarchic confusion, in which, for a brief time, each had been trying to compass his own ambitious ends in selfish indifference to the welfare of the people they were proposing to deliver from the Spanish yoke. The opening of the year 1579 saw Orange and Palmer face to face, preparing to measure their strength in a grim struggle for the mastery. In the very same month as witnessed the signing of the Union of Arras, a rival union had been formed in the northern Netherlands, which was destined to be much more permanent. The real author, however, of the Union of Utrecht was not Orange, but his brother, John of Nassau. In March 1578, John had been elected Stadtholder of Gelderland. He, like William, had devoted himself heart and soul to the cause of Netherland freedom, but his Calvinism was far more pronounced than his brother's. From the moment of his acceptance of the Stadtholdership, he set to work to effect a close union between Holland, Zeeland and Utrecht, with Gelderland and the adjoining districts, which lay around the Zuidersee. It was a difficult task, since the eastern provinces were afraid, and not unjustly, that its much greater wealth would give Holland predominance in the proposed confederation. Nevertheless, it was accomplished, and an act of union was drawn up and signed at Utrecht, January 29, 1579, by the representatives of Holland, Zeeland, and the town and district, Sticht, of Utrecht, Gelderland, and Zutphen, by which they agreed to defend their rights and liberties, and to resist all foreign intervention in their affairs, by common action, as if they were one province, and to establish and maintain freedom of conscience, and of worship, within their boundaries. William does not at first to have been altogether pleased with his brother's handiwork. He still hoped that a confederation on a much wider scale might have been formed, comprising the greater part of those who had appended their signatures to the pacification of Ghent. It was not until some months had passed, and he saw that his dreams of a larger union were not to be realised, that he signed on May 3rd the Act of Union drawn up at Utrecht. By this time he was well aware that Palmer had succeeded in winning over the malcontent nobles to accept his terms. On May the 19th, the Walloon provinces, whose representatives had signed the Union of Arras, agreed to acknowledge, with certain nominal reservations, the sovereignty of Philip, and to allow only Catholic worship, in fact, the reconciliation was complete. Thus, despite the efforts of Orange, the idea of the federation of all the seventeen provinces on national lines became a thing of the past, 
henceforth unattainable. The Netherlands were divided into two camps. Gradually in the course of 1580, over Issel, Drenthe, and the greater part of Friesland gave in their adherence to the Union of Utrecht, and Groningen and the Ommelanden allied themselves with their neighbours. In the rest of the Low Countries all fell away and submitted themselves to the king's authority, except Antwerp and Breda in Brabant, and Ghent, Bruges, and Ypres in Flanders. William felt that Palmer was constantly gaining ground. Defection after defection took place, the most serious being that of Georges Lulin, Count of Renneberg, the stadtholder of Groningen. Negotiations were indeed secretly opened with William himself, and the most advantageous and flattering terms offered to him, if he would desert the patriot cause. But with him, opposition to Spain and to Spanish methods of government was a matter of principle and strong conviction. He was proof alike against bribery and cajolery, and even when he perceived, as the year 1580 succeeded 1579, that he had no staunch friends on whom he could absolutely rely, save in the devoted provinces of Holland and Zeeland. For things had been going from bad to worse. The excesses and cruelties submitted by the Calvinists, wherever they found themselves in a position to persecute a Catholic minority, and especially the outrages perpetrated at Ghent, under the leadership of two Calvinist fanatics, de Ruhove and de Hembuse, although they were done in direct opposition to the wishes and efforts of Orange, always and at all times the champion of toleration, did much to discredit him in Flanders and Brabant, and to excite bitter indignation among the Catholics, who still formed the great majority of the population of the Netherlands. William felt himself to be month by month losing power. The action he was at last compelled to take, in rescuing Ghent from the hands of the ultra-democratic Calvinist party, and in expelling de Ruhove and de Hembuse, caused him to be denounced as a papist at heart. Indeed, the bigots of both creeds, at that age of intolerance and persecution, were utterly unable to understand his attitude, and could only attribute it to a lack of any sincere religious belief at all. Farnese, meanwhile, whose genius for Machiavellian statesmanship was as remarkable as those gifts for leadership in war, which entitled him to rank as the first general of his time, was a man who never failed to take full advantage of the mistakes and weaknesses of his opponents. At the head of a veteran force he laid siege in the spring of 1579 to the important frontier town of Maestricht. He encountered a desperate resistance, worthy of the defence of Haarlem or of Leiden, and for four months the garrison held out grimly in the hope of relief. But despite all the efforts of Orange to dispatch an adequate force to raise the siege, at last, June twenty-ninth, the town was carried by assault, and delivered up for three days to the fury of a savage soldiery. By the possession of this key to the Moise, Palmer was now able to cut off communication between Brabant and Protestant Germany. Had he indeed been adequately supported by Philip, it is probable that at this time all the provinces up to the borders of Holland might have been brought into subjection by the Spanish forces. The position of William was beset with perils on every side. One by one his adherents were deserting him. Even in the provinces of Holland and Zeeland he was losing ground. He saw clearly that without foreign help the national cause for which he had sacrificed everything was doomed. In this emergency he reopened negotiations with Anjou, not because he had any trust in the French prince's capacity or sincerity, but for the simple reason that there was no one else to whom he could turn. As heir to the throne of France, and at this time the favoured suitor of Queen Elizabeth, his acceptance of the sovereignty of the Netherlands would secure, so Orange calculated, the support both of France and England. It was his hope also that the limiting conditions attached to the offer of sovereignty would enable him to exercise a strong personal control over a man of weak character like Anjou. The Duke's vanity and ambition were flattered by the proposal, and on September 19, 1580, a provisional treaty was signed at Plessis-de-Tours, 
by which Anjou accepted the offer that was made to him, and showed himself quite ready to agree to any limitations imposed upon his authority, since he had not any intention, when once he held the reins of power, of observing them. The first effect of William's negotiation with Anjou was to alienate the Calvinists without gaining over the Catholics. Anjou was suspect to both. The action of the Spanish government, however, at this critical juncture, did much to restore the credit of the prince, with all to whom the Spanish tyranny and the memory of Alva were abhorrent. Cardinal Granvelle, after fifteen years of semi-exile in Italy, had lately been summoned to Madrid to become chief adviser to the king. Granvelle spared no pains to impress upon Philip the necessity of getting rid of Orange as the chief obstacle to the pacification of the Netherlands, and advised that a price should be placed upon his life. The very fear of it will paralyze or kill him, was the opinion of the cardinal, who ought to have had a better understanding of the temper and character of his old adversary. Accordingly, at Maastricht, March 15, 1581, a ban and edict in form of proscription was published against the prince, who was denounced as a traitor and miscreant, an enemy of ourselves and of our country, and all and everywhere empowered to seize the person and goods of this William of Nassau as enemy of the human race. A solemn promise was also made to any one who has the heart to free us of this pest, and who would deliver him dead or alive, or take his life, the sum of twenty-five thousand crowns in gold, or in estates for himself and his heirs, and we will pardon him any crimes of which he has been guilty, and give him a patent of nobility, if he be not noble. It is a document which, however abhorrent or loathsome it may appear to us, was characteristic of the age in which it was promulgated, and in accordance with the ideas of that cruel time. The ban was a declaration of war to the knife, and as such it was received and answered. In reply to the ban, the prince at the close of the year, December 13th, published a very lengthy defence of his life and actions, the famous Apology. To William himself is undoubtedly due the material which the document embodies, and the argument it contains, but it was almost certainly not written by him, but by his chaplain, Pierre Louis Leur, Seigneur de Villiers, to whom he owes its rather ponderous prolixity and redundant verbiage. Historically, it is of very considerable value, though the facts are not always to be relied upon as strictly accurate. The apology was translated into several languages and distributed to the leading personages in every neighbouring country, and made a deep impression on men's minds. The combined effect of the ban and the apology was to strengthen William's position in all the provinces where the Patriot Party still held the upper hand, and it was not slow to take advantage of the strong anti-Spanish feeling which was aroused. Its intensity was shown by the solemn act of abjuration, July 26, 1581, by which the provinces of Brabant, Flanders, Holland, Zeeland, Utrecht and Gelderland renounced their allegiance to Philip II on the ground of his tyranny and misrule. But after signing this act, it never seems to have occurred to the prince or to the representatives of the provinces that these now derelict territories could remain without a personal sovereign. Orange used all his influence and persuasiveness to induce them to accept Anjou. Anjou, as we have seen, had already agreed to the conditions under which he should, when invited, become prince and lord of the Netherlands. In the autumn of 1581 the position was an ambiguous one. The States-General claimed that, after the abjuration of Philip, the sovereignty of the provinces had reverted to them, as the common representative of a group of provinces that were now sovereign in their own right, and that the conferring of that sovereignty on another overlord was their prerogative. The position of Orange was peculiar, for de facto, under one title or another, he exercised the chief authority in each one of the rebel provinces, but in the name of the States-General, 
instead of the king. His influence indeed was so great as to overshadow that of the States-General, but great as it was, it had to be exerted to the utmost before that body could be induced to accept a man of Anjou's despicable and untrustworthy character as their new ruler. William, however, had committed himself to the candidature of the Duke through lack of any fitter choice, and at last both the States-General and the several provincial estates, Holland and Zeeland excepted, agreed to confer the sovereignty upon the French prince subject to the conditions of the Treaty of Plessis de Tours. William himself exercised the powers with which Holland and Zeeland had invested him in the name of the king, whose stadtholder he was, even when waging war against him. After the abjuration, this pretense could no longer be maintained. The estates of Holland and Zeeland had indeed petitioned Orange to become their count, but he refused the title, fearing to give umbrage to Anjou. Finding, however, the two provinces resolute in their opposition to the Valois prince, he consented, July twenty fourth, 1581, to exercise provisionally, as if he were count, the powers of high supremacy which had already been conferred upon him. Meanwhile Anjou was dallying in England, but on receiving, through saint Gond an intimation that the States could brook no further delay, he set sail and landed at Flushing. Lord Leicester and a brilliant English escort accompanied him, and Elizabeth asked the States to receive her suitor as her own self. At Antwerp, where he took up his residence, Anjou was, February 19th, solemnly invested with the Duchy of Brabant, and received the homage of his new subjects. He was far from popular, and William remained at his side, to give him support and counsel. On March 18th, Anjou's birthday, an untoward event occurred, which threatened to have the most disastrous consequences. As Orange was leaving the dinner table, a young Biscayan, Juan Jorgi by name, attempted his assassination by firing a pistol at him. The ball entered his head by the right ear and passed through the pallet. Jorgi was instantly killed, and it was afterwards found that he had, for the sake of the reward, been instigated to the deed by his master, a merchant named Caspar Anastro. Anjou, who was at first suspected of being accessory to the crime, was thus exculpated. It was a terrible wound, and William's life was for some time in great danger, but by the assiduous care of his physicians and nurses, he very slowly recovered, and was strong enough on May 2nd, to attend a solemn service of thanksgiving. The shock of the event and the long weeks of anxiety were, however, too heavy a strain upon his wife, Charlotte de Bourbon, who had recently given birth to their sixth daughter. Her death, on May 5th, was deeply grieved by the prince, for Charlotte had been a most devoted helpmeet and adviser to him throughout the anxious years of their married life. During the whole of the summer and autumn, William remained at Antwerp, patiently trying to smooth away the difficulties caused by the dislike and suspicion felt by the Netherlanders for the man whom they were asked to recognize as their sovereign. It was an arduous task, but William, at the cost of his own popularity, succeeded in getting the Duke acknowledged in July as Lord of Friesland and Duke of Gelderland. Anjou was solemnly installed at Bruges as Count of Flanders. Meanwhile he was planning, with the help of the large French force which Anjou had undertaken to bring into the Netherlands, to take the offensive against Parma. The truth is that he and Anjou were really playing at cross-purposes. Orange wished Anjou to be the roi fainéant of a united Netherlands state, of which he himself should be the real ruler. But Anjou had no intention of being treated as a second Matthias. He secretly determined to make himself master of Antwerp by a sudden attack, and this achieved to proceed to seize by force of arms some of the other principal cities, and to make himself sovereign in reality as well as in name. He resented his dependence upon Orange, and was resolved to rid himself of it. With shameless treachery in the early morning of January the 17th, 1583, he paid visit to the prince in Antwerp, 
and with the object of gaining possession of his person, tried to persuade him to attend a review of the French regiments who were encamped outside the town. The suspicions of William had, however, been aroused, and he pleaded some excuse for declining the invitation. At midday, some thousands of Anjou's troops rushed into the city at the dinner hour with loud cries of, Ville gagné! Tu! Tu! But the citizens flew to arms, barricades were erected, and finally the French were driven out with heavy loss, leaving some fifteen hundred prisoners in the hands of the town guard. Many French nobles perished, and the French fury, as it was called, was an ignominious and ghastly failure. Indignation was wide and deep throughout the provinces, and William's efforts to calm the excitement and patch up some fresh agreement with the false Valois, though for the moment partially successful, only added to his own growing unpopularity. The prince, in fact, was so wedded to the idea that the only hope for the provinces lay in securing French aid that he seemed unable to convince himself that Anjou after this act of base treachery was impossible. His continued support of the duke only served to alienate the people of Brabant and Flanders. The Protestants hated the thought of having as their sovereign a prince who was a Catholic and whose mother and brothers were looked upon by them as the authors of the massacre of St. Bartholomew. The Catholics cajoled by Parma's fair words, and alarmed by the steady progress of his arms, were already inclining to return to their old legions. The marriage of Orange, April 7, 1583, to Louise, daughter of the famous Huguenot leader Admiral Coligny, and widow of the Sieur de Tilligny, added to the feelings of distrust and hostility he had already aroused, for the bride was a Frenchwoman, and both her father and husband had perished on the fatal St. Bartholomew's Day. Finding himself exposed to insult, and his life ever in danger, William, at the end of July, left Antwerp and took up his residence again at Delft in the midst of his faithful Hollanders. They, too, disliked his French proclivities, but his alliance with Louise de Tilligny seemed to be an additional pledge to those strong Calvinists of his religious sincerity. Meanwhile, Anjou had already returned to France, and Palmer had now a freer field for his advance northwards, and though sorely hampered by lack of funds, was rapidly taking town after town. In the spring of 1584, he took Ypres and Bruges, and a strong party in Ghent was in traitorous correspondence with him. Many nobles had fallen away from the patriot cause, among them William's brother-in-law, Count Vandenberg who had succeeded John of Nassau as Stadtholder of Gelderland. The hold of Orange upon Brabant and the Scheld was, however, still insured by the possession of Antwerp, of which strongly fortified town the trusty St. Aldegonde was governor. Meanwhile the prince, who was still striving hard to persuade the provinces that were hostile to Spanish rule, that their only hope lay in obtaining aid from France through Anjou, was living at the old convent of St. Agatha, afterwards known as the Prinzenhof at Delft. His manner of life was of the most modest and homely kind, just like that of an ordinary Dutch burgher. He was in fact deeply in debt, terribly worried with the outward aspect of things, and his position became one of growing difficulty, for on June 10th, 1584, the miserable Anjou died, and the policy on which he had for so long expended his best efforts was wrecked. Even his own recognition as Count of Holland and Zeeland had led to endless negotiations between the estates and the various town councils which claimed to have a voice in the matter, and in July 1584 he had, though provisionally exercising sovereign authority, not yet received formal homage. And all this time, in addition to the other cares that weighed heavily upon him, there was the continual dread of assassination. Ever since the failure of the attempt of Jorgui, there had been a constant succession of plots against the life of the rebel leader and heretic at the instigation of the Spanish government and with the knowledge of Palmer. Religious fanaticism, loyalty to the legitimate sovereign, together with the more sordid motive of 
pecuniary reward made many eager to undertake the murderous commission. It was made the easier from the fact that the prince always refused to surround himself with guards or to take any special precautions, and was always easy of access. Many schemes and proposed attempts came to nothing, either through the vigilance of William's spies, or through the lack of courage of the would-be assassins. A youth named Balthazar Girard had, however, become assessed with the conviction that he had a special mission to accomplish the deed in which Jean-Guy had failed, and he devoted himself to the task of ridding the world of one whom he looked upon as the arch-enemy of God and the king. Under the false name of Francis Guillon, he made his way to Delft, pretended to be a zealous Calvinist flying from persecution, and went about begging for alms. The prince, even in his poverty, always charitable, hearing of his needy condition, sent to the man a present of twelve crowns. With this gift, Girard bought a pair of pistols, and on July 10, 1584, having managed on some pretext to gain admittance to the Prinzenhof, he concealed himself in a dark corner by the stairs just opposite the door of the room where William and his family were dining. As the prince, accompanied by his wife, three of his daughters and one of his sisters, came out and was approaching the staircase, the assassin darted forward and fired two bullets into his breast. The wound was mortal. William fell to the ground and speedily expired. Tradition says that, as he fell, he exclaimed in French, My God, have pity on my soul! My God, have pity on this poor people! But an examination of the contemporary records of the murder throws considerable doubt on the statement that such words were uttered. The nature of the wound was such that the probability is that intelligible speech was impossible. Balthazar Girard gloried in his deed, and bore the excruciating tortures which were inflicted upon him with almost superhuman patience and courage. He looked upon himself as a martyr in the holy cause, and as such he was regarded by Catholic public opinion. His deed was praised both by Granvelle and Parma, and Philip bestowed a patent of nobility on his family, and exempted them from taxation. In Holland there was a deep and general grief at the tragic ending of the great leader, who had for so many years been the fearless and indefatigable champion of their resistance to civil and religious tyranny. He was accorded a public funeral and buried with great pomp in the Neue Kerk at Delft, where a stately memorial, recording his many high qualities and services, was erected to his memory. William of Orange was but fifty-one years of age when his life was thus prematurely ended, and though he had been much aged by the cares and anxieties of a crushing responsibility, his physicians declared that at the time of his death he was perfectly healthy, and that he might have been spared to carry on his work for many years, had he escaped the bullets of the assassin. But it was not to be. It is possible that he should be reckoned in the number of those whose manner of death sets the seal to a life-work of continuous self-sacrifice. The title of Father of His Country, which was affectionately given to him by Hollanders of every class, was never more deservedly bestowed, for it was in the Holland that his exertions had freed, and that he had made the impregnable fortress of the resistance of Spain that he ever felt more at home than anywhere else. It was in the midst of his own people, that he laid down the life that had been consecrated to their cause. As a general, he had never been successful. As a statesman, he had failed to accomplish that union of the Netherlands, north and south, which at one triumphant moment had seemed to be well nigh realized by the pacification of Ghent. But he had, by the spirit that he aroused in Holland and its sister province of Zeeland, created a barrier against Spanish domination in the northern Netherlands, which was not to be broken down. End of chapter 5 Recorded by Gesine in June 2007